Hello, how are you? My name is Matt and thank you for joining me for our very first episode of the Beyond the Shadow web series. I'm going to sit down with world famous psychic surgeon and physical medium Gary Mannion. Now please help me out by liking, sharing, commenting and tell your mum about the web series. Let's get started. Um, it's, it's really great to have this opportunity to have a discussion with you. Uh, if it's okay, I'd really like to start um, and learn about your earliest years and how you became involved um, with healing work. Uh, okay, so for my spiritual work, it really started back when I was a child. Apparently, I used to see and talk to people who weren't physically there. Uh, for me personally, I have no memory of anything like that before the age of 13. Um, when I was 13, my dad took me along to the local spiritualist church. Um, and I was sitting down the front, saw the medium tune in, and all of a sudden I heard a voice in my head saying, you can do that. So being 13, hearing voices in my head, I gave it a go. Um, and that started me off on my kind of psychic mediumship pathway, uh, which I did for a couple of years. And then when I was 18, I was up in Manchester in the UK, um, teaching some psychic development. Um, went to do a bit of spiritual healing with the group. They already had this uh, form of healing that they did. Uh, and they asked me if I wanted to take part. So I was like, yeah, you know, put your hands on someone, let the energy come through. Yeah, how hard can it be? I'll give it a go. Um, I'd already done some spiritual healing in my local church up to that point. Um, I had special permission from the SNU in the UK to do healing at my local church. Um, so I went to start with this woman lying on the couch um, and I was instructed by the group to work on her stomach. So I went to start, went to make a connection and all of a sudden I felt this very strong presence behind me and I saw these hands going into her stomach and pulling out what to me looked like mold, uh, which I hadn't seen before. So I did the healing. After the healing, I said to her, look, this is probably really strange, but I saw this mold getting pulled out of my stomach. And she said, actually, no, it makes perfect sense. I have this condition where food doesn't always adjust in my stomach. So every now and then I have to go to the hospital to get it removed and it goes on moldy. So I thought, strange, but okay, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, from then on, whenever I would do healing, I would see these hands go in and, in a sense, operate. Uh, and then over time, that just kind of developed into to what it is today, really. <laughs> so, so tell me about how you do work um, with, with healing-wise. Uh, so when I work, uh, I work with a guy called Abraham. He's my main surgeon. Now, different psychic surgeons work differently um, and have different kind of modalities. Um, the way I really work is Abraham has a team of surgeons that work with him um, so that I don't get confused or have to remember multiple different personalities. I always deal directly with Abraham. So even if he's not the healer in charge at the time, he's still the one that gives me the information. Um, so when I work, I will give Abraham control of my physical hands. So he will move, he'll manipulate, um, he'll carry out the healing. Uh, while he's doing that, I will tend to see and feel what's going inside the body. So often while we're doing the psychic surgery side, which most of the time is non-invasive psychic surgery, um, I'm also doing the medical intuitive side. So giving feedback to the patient what's going on with the problem, why it exists, and, and what they can do to, to make changes in their life. It's extraordinary seeing uh, a work. I've been in a number of your sessions, you know, both in daylight and also in, in dark and sort of seance conditions. And uh, what I always found remarkable is without giving any sort of uh, hint as to what's happening, Abe would always be able to hone in on the exact condition that's causing the most discomfort you mentioned both invasive and also non-invasive techniques. Um, I, I recall you uh, talking to us about an experience where you traveled to Brazil. Are you able to tell us that story? So uh, one of the most famous psychic surgeons uh, in the world in this era uh, would be John God. Um, and a couple of years ago now, he's uh, one of his guides, a physical guide who'd bring people over to Brazil. I went there, mentioned about me, and his spirit team invited me to come along and work. Um, so I'm not going to turn on an offer like that. So I accepted. I went out to Brazil, spent a couple of weeks there, um, got to work kind of very closely with him. It was, a, it was amazing work. So in Brazil, psychic surgeons are allowed to cut skin. Um, so with psychic surgery, there isn't a need to cut skin. It works just as effectively not cutting skin. Um, but often it's done to show people that it can be done. Um, so in Brazil, different psychic surgeons will work by either cutting the skin with their hands, some will use a scalpel, um, and 
with John of God, he'll actually use a scalpel when he cuts. Um, amazing when he works, he uses no anesthetic, but when spirit are in control, he, he cuts the skin. Uh, there's no pain, no discomfort. Um, there's nothing hidden. There's nothing um, behind the curtains. You can watch it very clearly. There's no problem with him uh, allowing you to film it. Um, so you can actually see him physically cutting, removing things from the body. Um, he'll do things like put scissors up people's nose and, and pull it out with things attached to the scissors. Uh, he'll scrape the eye with the, with the scalpel. Uh, an amazing experience to, to not only see the surgery, but to see the results as well. So when you go there, what most people don't realize is most of the surgery that's done is invisible surgery. So nobody will physically touch you, but people will get amazing results. Um, when you are there, though, you can opt to have physical surgery or invisible surgery. So I didn't really have a, any problem, um, but I really wanted to know how it felt and to go through the experience. Um, so I went in there and I opted for physical surgery. Um, and so he said to me, or the spirit team said, uh, come back at two o'clock um, and you're going to go first. So I came back at two o'clock and yep, I go first. And on the video, I've still got, you can see he, he leads me out leading the group of, because he'll have a, a group of say five or six people he's going to work on at a time. Um, so he leads me out with the group and out of that group, I'm the only one he physically doesn't cut. Uh, everyone else he does surgery to. Me, he does some slight manipulation, but no cutting, nothing like that. Um, so when I went back the next day, I said, you know, I, I wanted to be cut. You didn't cut me. Why? Um, and the response was, we wanted to show you that we don't need to cut in order to work. Um, so speaking to the others in the group, um, you know, I saw you get cut. I was standing right next to you. How did it feel? A lot of people will say, and it's not just with John of God, but with other psychic surgeons that they cut. Um, people often say that just beforehand, they do feel nervous. You know, they're about to be cut. It's perfectly natural to feel nervous. Um, but just before they're about to be worked on, this calm comes over them. Um, now, there's another psychic surgeon from the past called Arrigo, also from Brazil. Um, and he was known as the surgeon of the rusty knife because he would use this rusty knife. Um, and with genuine psychic surgery, there's no cases of infection or anything like that, even if they're using dirty, rusty knives. Um, and Arrigo was fond of sticking the knife into your eye and then just leaving it there for a couple of minutes. You go and work with another client, then come back to you with this knife sticking out of your eye. Um, and actually, there's a video of Arrigo working where he's got this knife in under someone's eye um, and they're more disturbed by this fly on their other cheek than this knife sticking out of their eye. Um, so most people will tell you this calm just comes over you just before spirit's going to work. And generally it doesn't hurt. Sometimes there can be a discomfort, but generally it doesn't hurt. Um, also, normally with psychic surgery, there tends not to be much blood. So spirit tend to have good control over the blood flow. I say normally because there are cases where sometimes there is a lot of blood, but generally there isn't. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd be as brave as you to uh, to volunteer for the for the surgery component, but uh, it would definitely be fascinating to to see him at work. Uh, I'm a bit queasy when it comes to you know things in the eye. I used to be in the cabinet making industry and uh, saw some horrendous uh, scenarios with drills and, and chisels and eyes. So. Uh, uh, yeah, it makes me uh, a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, how, how does your psychic surgery differ to that of um, uh, St. John of God? Generally, we do non-invasive psychic surgery. I have cut skin a couple of times in the past, but generally, especially in the Western world, we don't cut. Um, so I will still, or my team will still manipulate through me. Um, so we may move joints and things like that. Um, you may hear some clicking or sound effects as we're working but well, there's going to be no cutting of the skin. Again, generally, there's no pain. Um, sometimes there is discomfort, but there's generally no pain. Um, compared to other forms of healing, a psychic surgery with me takes about 15 to 20 minutes, which doesn't seem long, but when you compare it to other psychic surgeons, um, most of them probably take about two or three minutes. Psychic mm -hmm. surgery is normally a very quick process, but tends to be very effective. And uh, in, in terms of all of the, the variety of cases you've worked with, what would you identify as... You know, some of the more memorable cases? Oh, uh, some of the memorable cases. Um, so a lot of times people who are coming with conditions that medically shouldn't get better. Um, you know, so I remember we had one case in the past where this guy had a severed nerve in his eye. So he'd been blind in that eye for three years. Um, and he came for a treatment and in one treatment, a couple of hours later, as he's driving home or as his wife's driving home, he notices that he can read the license plate number of the car in front of him. Uh, his eye that was blind, and had been blind for three years. Um, and as far as I know, he can still see in that eye. 
Um, so that was an amazing case because medically that shouldn't have been possible. Um, cases, especially where we can get things like x-rays beforehand and afterwards, so you can actually see the difference. And, and so when you've got cases that medically shouldn't respond, they're, they're fantastic, especially from an evidence point of view. Um, nowadays, though, I'd probably be more surprised by something I haven't worked with than by something I have. I, I think I've treated a bit of everything over the years. Fantastic. And, and when it does come to conditions, um, uh, the spirit team, you know, what do they see as the major contributors? Like, for example, um, there's a big movement at the moment on epigenetics where um, not only are you dealing with the own, your own issues in your tissues, but there's also those you've inherited from, you know, you, from your ancestors. And there was a study done uh, not so long ago where they were looking at three generations of mice and they conditioned the grandparent mice to be terrified of cherry blossoms. And all they would do is drop the, the blossoms into the cage and uh, it becomes so conditioned that the parent would be terrified. Their offspring had no negative reaction to it, but the offspring of the offspring, the minute there were petals dropping in, they were absolutely in, in terror and would run from these uh, cherry blossoms. And it showed that, you know, it, it, there's quite remarkable evidence supporting epigenetics. Yeah, epigenetics is a, a huge movement, even in the medical science at the moment where they're actually accepting it that there's so many cases of people will inherit the same conditions at the same age in their life as their parents or grandparents did, even down to things like divorces. You'll get divorced at the same age your parents or grandparents were. Um, and if you, you have to imagine the human body is like a computer. We take in uh, memories and belief systems, um, with, and it's an evolutionary trait, just like, you know, you don't need to teach a, a, an ape how to open a banana. It knows how to do it. You most animals you don't have to teach them what plants are poisonous or good for them they naturally know that because it's passed on through their genetics so epigenetics is a huge field of, of medical science at the moment um, and with any illness you have to imagine that we have a nice healthy energy field when we don't deal with an emotion or a problem we're going to store that somewhere in the energy field and over time with that not being addressed it's a finally going to manifest as something physically wrong in that area uh, and the physical is always the last manifestation so especially with healing, prevention is always better than cure. We want to treat something before it physically manifests because it's going to have been festering in the energy for a while. Um, and it's going to be things that we've taken from epigenetics, from our inheritance, from our genotype, from our environment, um, from our belief systems. Um, and that can go, normally when we talk about epigenetics, we're normally talking about eight generations or so. Some can go further back when we're looking at genotypes, uh, but generally it's around eight generations. Sometimes they're sending energy into the cellular systems to reprogram them fundamentally, and other times they're recreating atomic structures and, mo and molecules. So I guess from your experience, I know you're often in trance in these sessions, you know, what, what do you see as the process? How, how are the spirit team working? Um, so I think they're working on many different layers. Um, and I know Abraham will often say that the human body is made of, of many energetic layers, both physically and spiritually, which is why they use us as mediums in the first place. Um, some people need that physical counterpart, that grounding of the energy. Otherwise, they would do all the work themselves and it would all be absent. Um, so sometimes it is working with the cell or the DNA. Um, and if you look at our cells, we carry so much rubbish genetic code. So, so much of our uh, genetic code is just left over from our past ancestors that we don't use it anymore. It's dormant um, under certain circumstances that can become activated. Um, but yes, yeah, so much of our DNA is just kind of rubbish or not utilized. So sometimes he may be working on that DNA strands to, to change that code, to maybe reactivate something you need or deactivate something that's become activated that you don't need. Um, sometimes it may just be working more simply on a more mental level. So dealing with your current life stresses or anxieties. Um, sometimes, it, well, most times it's going to be working on an emotional level. Um, a lot of times, especially in modern times now, it, a lot of the healing is getting you to accept the healing because a lot of people will use their illnesses as an emotional crutch. So sometimes healing is just about trying to get you to a space where you actually want to receive healing. Uh, you may not like suffering, but you may like the attention that suffering brings you. Um, so, and if that attention outweighs the suffering, you'll still choose to suffer. 
<clears throat> it's sort of process of transmutation where different systems within the anatomy of the soul, so to speak, are influencing other systems. And the more rooted it is in your beliefs or in your expressions of your own emotions will uh, determine the level of physical manifestation of those conditions. So what you're saying is they're working in whatever area needs the most work. Yeah. So how you can have two people with the exact same condition and you still have to treat them as very separate problems because how one manifests that problem may be completely different to the next person. But humans in general really are like computers. We have codes that we run on, we have programs that we run on, um, and most of the time the human body, especially from a scientific point of view, is very predictable. It's going to follow a pathway, uh, even down to how we respond to certain emotions or how we can get conditioned to certain things, and that's what psychology is looking at a lot now. Um, but yeah, our body will just run on programs. So with healing, it's sometimes just about changing that program because your body thinks what it's doing is the correct thing. Um, even when we look at things like autoimmune problems, the body thinks it's protecting itself. It's actually causing more harm and killing itself, but the body is just doing what it's programmed to do, thinking it's protecting itself. Fantastic. And um, <clears throat> I recall in the early days when I first met you and um, uh, we were looking at some of your own background, there was... Uh, a time when you were talking about um, how your own healing work was studied for a number of years. Yeah, so one aspect of my, my spiritual work is I do like to document where possible and get, gain evidence where possible. So on the healing side, I was scientifically researched for five and a half years uh, through an organization called PRISM uh, and the Scottish Society of Psychical Research. Um, so they researched me for five and a half years uh, through Professor Archie Roy, uh, and Trisha Robertson um, in, in Scotland. And through the five and a half years, we had a 90% success rate under their testing. Fantastic, that's amazing. Um, I, I did ask you about your most memorable case before. Um, I don't think I can let it go without asking what are some of the strangest cases you've had to look at? Um, I have had some very strange cases. Um, I mean, sadly, with any kind of spiritual thing you you get both ends of the spectrum so you get those who generally need the healing you do get some though though who are generally disturbed in their mind and um, may have some underlying mental illnesses that are being made worse by their their symptoms um, i remember having this woman come with her son they'd flown over from spain they were english but they were living in spain um so when i said well how can i help what's the problem uh she fully believed that her son was the reincarnation of satan um, that he had now joined the good side, um, that the world was about to end. So they'd moved to Spain where they were kind of living in a nuclear bunker waiting for this end to happen. Um, I remember another case where this lady came and sometimes you can just tell when someone is psychotic, you can just see it in them. Um, and she kind of looked quite psychotic. So right. I said to you, well, how can I help? What's the problem? And she goes, well, I want Abraham to... Um, kill my partner and make social services give my baby back <laughs> uh, that was quite an interesting case um, i'll also get a lot of cases where people will come up to me especially at like mind body soul shows and they'll go oh abraham came to me last night and you know he said that you need to work on me today um that you're gonna teach me this that and the other and i'll have to kind of say well he hasn't told me yet um so yeah, I've had some I've had some very amazing cases and I have had some very bizarre cases. At what age did you begin your own mediumship? So for me, it was when I was 13. Um, I got taken along to that spiritualist church, um, saw the medium tune in, heard a voice in my head, gave it a go. It seemed to work. Um, thankfully, the church I was at at the time, they were quite open. They were quite accepting. So they would let me practice on, on people after services. Um, and so that's what kind of developed it and started off. Um, and then the head healer of my church, um, she kept saying to me, look, you're going to be a healer, not a medium. And do you know, back then I really had no interest in healing. I would see people come week after week to the healing services, um, with the same problems. And I was kind of think, well, yeah, I mean, it's nice kind of five, 10 minutes, but what's the point? My interest was with mediumship. Um, and so she actually got special permission from the SNU to let me practice healing at the church before I was 18. Um, and she, basically i wanted to get into the, the church's home circle um and i was told look if you do the healing i'll get you into the home circle so although i had no interest in the healing i was like okay yeah i'll, I'll do it um, and actually the spiritual healing because i was 
quite a robust child. I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was, I think I was misunderstood, but um, the healing really calmed me down and gave me an outlook kind of for all that energy. Um, and actually nowadays, my love is for healing. You know, I like mediumship, but there's plenty of mediums out there that could probably do a better job than me. Um, my forte and my love is, is for healing. Um, but I needed that mediumship to get me into that pathway. Fantastic. And uh, so tell us about how you met um, Abe, you know, who is Abe? So I said my first experience was when I was 18, this, this presence out of nowhere that I knew nothing about would just come in and do healing. And the kind of the first couple of times I would do healing, literally just this, every time I would go to do healing, this strong presence would come in. I have no idea who it was. Um, they would just do the healing and go. Then eventually one day they came through and then started talking and said that their, their name was Abraham. Um, and I remember years ago when I was doing the BBC documentary, um, the good question they put to me is, is why Abraham? Uh, you know, because you have connotations then to the Bible. And um, actually, if you look at especially Brazilian psychic surgery, they have a lot of references to um, the Catholic religion, to the Bible, um, either biblical characters or working in the name of Jesus for whatever reason. I think it's because of their culture. Um, but as I said to the, the, B, the BBC, look, if I was going to make up a, a character to use to do my healing, surely I'd go for someone like Hippocrates, the father of medicine, or someone who was a renowned doctor. Why I'd pick a random character from the Bible. Um, so Abraham, yes, there's a lot of connotations that link him with the Abraham from the Bible. He would kind of have lived in the same period. He's from the same place, a place called Ur, which is apparently now in Iraq. Um, but he will say himself that the Abraham depicted in the Bible is a very different person to him. Um, Abraham was not a healer in life. He used to lead tribes. Um, and healing is something he got to, into from spirit side of life. Um, and then he found uh, me to be his medium to, to direct the energy through. Um, now, what I like about Abraham is I can do mediumship and I can hear spirit. But with Abraham, when he's working with me, when he's talking to me, it's as clear as anyone physically talking to me. I can hear him very, very clearly, much more clearly than any other spirit. Fantastic. And um, do you know how long uh, Abe will be working with you? Hopefully for a while yet. Um, he will make it clear that I don't own him. I have no ownership over him. He works with me because I choose to work with him, uh, not because he has to. Um, so one day he may find that he will move on to a medium that can better suit his needs and what he's trying to achieve. Um, hopefully he's going to be with me for a while yet. Um, he will definitely go to anyone who calls on him and if he can help, he will. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we still got a lot to do and we're, we're definitely looking to advance it now that we got into doing our spiritual seances, um, our healing seances, sorry. Um, so hopefully he's going to be with me for a while yet progressing that. Fantastic. And uh, one of the things you mentioned there, uh, BBC had done a documentary on your uh, psychic surgery and mediumship. Yeah, God, it was a while ago now, uh, my young years. Uh, yeah, so they approached me. They, they did an, an hour's documentary on me, which basically meant four months of them following me around, um, filming everything. Um, sadly, I mean, for the BBC being the BBC, it actually didn't go out that badly. Um, but for the BBC being the BBC, it was very one-sided. Um, you would think a documentary is meant to be very um, on the spot, unplanned. But actually, no, a lot of documentaries, there is a lot of setup. You have to redo things over and over um, so they can get the right scene. Um, so it's, it is a lot more scripted than, than they think. But it was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was great. We got some good evidence. Um, sadly, they didn't show a lot of the good evidence we had. But yeah, it was it was actually quite fun. It was, it was a really fun experience. I remember you telling me um, uh, at one point there, there was a, a, an incident where they were involved in some table tipping with some football players. Oh, yes. Gosh, that was. Uh, uh, you, you remember better than me. God. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so I used to work a lot in Switzerland up in the mountains um, and there I would do workshops. And this is before I really got into doing uh, physical seances. Um, I actually started off with my physical journey by doing table tipping. Um, and actually, the way that started is I used to work for the London Paranormal Society um, and we were doing an investigation one night in this um, supposed haunted location and it had been quite a dull night we hadn't got much activity so we thought we'd try a bit of table tipping um, and with the London Paranormal Society we used to do a lot of media and um, so we would often get called to events for uh, newspapers or tv crews that wanted to 
do a venue. So we really want to try and have something happen. And it was a dull night. So we're doing table tipping, not, not much is happening. Um, so the guy called Ian who ran the um, organization, he said, why don't you ask Abraham to see if he can come forward and push the table? Um, so I was like, well, I can ask. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you will, but I'll ask. Um, so I was like, you know, Abraham, if you're there, can you, can you push the table? Can you knock on the table? Um, he didn't, but another personality did, and we started getting results. So that kind of started me off with table tipping. And, and back then, we used to get some really good results with table tipping. So when I was in Switzerland, um, we would do table tipping every now and then. Um, so one of their big football teams came to join us one night uh, for a table tip. Um, and you would think all oh, these big, strong, burly men, they were cowards once you got them on the table. Um, and I can remember at one point we put three of them on the table uh, and the table's still flying around the room with them on the table. And all you can hear is them screaming because um, they're cowards. And yeah, you would think that these are strong, brave guys and they really weren't once you got them on the table. Um, Gary, one of the um, uh, aspects that I've really liked about your own mediumship is your one-to-one -one program where I've been able to spend some time with you and how you've really tailored techniques to help enhance you know, my own mediumship and development. Are you able to give us a bit of a, an overview of how the one-to-one -one program works? Uh, the one-to-one -one program. So it works with the basis that everyone works differently. So there's thousands of techniques to work with spirit, whether that's mediumship, healing, physical mediumship, trance, altered states. Um, some techniques may work for you, others may not. And this is where you'll get someone that's maybe sitting in a circle for 20 years. Um, they're learning all the right techniques, but not for them. And that's why they're not getting anywhere. Whereas if you develop in the right way for you, then you may find that actually after a couple of sessions that you're making great leaps. So with the one-to-one, -one, we, we do have a range of different techniques. The way it works is normally we would speak over video chat, uh, say around twice a week. Um, I would then set you exercises on our website. You would have access to all the exercises. Um, so what would happen is you would go and you would try the exercises. If you had any issues or problems, you'd let me know. We'd then go back and have another chat um, and we'd work out what's going wrong, what we need to look at, maybe come away from the exercise and look at something else and then come back to it. Um, so it's completely tailored around you. Alongside that, we run a load of live classes and practical classes. I think we're doing about 14 a week at the moment. Um, they run at all different times, all different time zones. Um, so the ones you can do, you just jump in and that kind of what you're learning in the exercises, it allows you to put to practice um, and you're kind of guided the whole way through. So it's completely on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, unlike other training programs as well, you're not tied into anything because you may get someone who just needs a couple of weeks mentorship. Uh, they just need to adjust a couple of things um, and then they're fine. And then you may get someone actually that needs a lot of guidance and may need a year. So it's very open to, it's there for as long as you need it, but you're not tied into anything. I'm a big fan of your uh, feeling your way into trance where you know, you're becoming aware of how your body responds because what I identified very quickly is, you know, I'm, I was a control freak. I was able to to go into the zone, but I wasn't letting go and, and uh, you know, giving the, the power to spirit to let them do their work. And, uh, you know, I still have times where I'm a little bit stubborn, but you knew exactly what the problem was and practicing the techniques. You know, that, that first time I applied it, there was knocking and stuff happening in the room, which was really exciting. Now, the other thing, um, you, you do have a live event coming up soon on Eventbrite. Yes. So every now and then I will do a live um, online trance demo. So we've got one coming up in the next few weeks. Um, so that is a question and answer. So um, in that session, we'll be hopefully bringing through Jimmy, who works with my physical team, uh, as well as Abraham, who does the healing side. Um, so you can pretty much ask them anything, really. Um, and if they have an answer, they'll, they'll give you the answer. So normally it's kind of spiritual subjects we get. You know, what happens when you die? Have you met Jesus? Does he play poker? That kind of stuff. But we get a lot of questions, especially recently, we've had a lot of questions about COVID, natural disasters, uh, a lot of questions about conspiracy theories, extraterrestrials, um, what's happening on the planet. Literally, you can ask a little bit about anything. We also get a lot of personal questions as well. Fantastic. So for the benefit of everyone, we'll put the link down the bottom. So it's uh, nice and accessible and also the link to the one-to-one -one and uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Well, uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time out for a chat, Gary, and uh, there's a million other questions we could ask, but uh, in, in the interest of time, we, we might uh, wrap this session up, and I, I really appreciate your time, and then uh, we'll have a chat on a, on a future episode about a, a few other areas. Definitely. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Gary.